obviously you have your own platforms. You're a bodybuilder, you're a race car driver, you're an ultra endurance athlete. At what point in your career did you say, okay, I've got something here and I can use my platform to form my voice for activism? So for me, it happened in um, 2006. It was when a movie called An Inconvenient Truth came out. And I had already been pretty vocal to my family and my friends about my concern about the human impact on our planet. Um, but seeing that film actually made me realize I, I can't just talk to my family and friends about this. I, I need to talk to everybody that I can. And so that's when I started a program where I adopted an acre of rainforest every time I ran a race. And I started to actively engage with the racing fans about um, what we were doing to our planet. And I had this sort of light bulb moment that happened um, where I saw all this traffic coming to my racing website from a NASCAR forum. And so out of curiosity, I went to see what was happening. And it turned out that somebody was very upset that I was promoting an inconvenient truth and was calling me all kinds of names and very upset with me. And, um, you know, at first that hurts, but then I kept reading. And eventually the discussion became, you know, well, if you haven't actually seen the movie, how can you be so angry at this driver for promoting it? Um, and then the conversation shifted and it started to be about climate change. And people on this NASCAR forum were discussing the parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And that sort of flipped a switch for me where I realized the bigger picture. Um, I had been a biology graduate from University of California in San Diego before I started racing, so it didn't make sense to go racing. And then all of a sudden the, the, the switch clicked for me and I realized, you know, as a driver I had this 200 mile an hour billboard with my race car and I could use it to address these issues. And so since, since around 2006 was when I um, really started to actively engage. And then I found out that, you know, the race fans have a lot more in common with us than, than you would think. And, they're loving the vegan food and they're concerned about global warming and they're wanting to get electric cars and put solar on their roof. Um, so I think just having an open mind and being kind and understanding everybody's on a different point in their journey, um, you will find that there are many more people that, that are on our side. Rich or Luke, either one of you pop in. How, what was the experience for you in finding your voice for activism? It really evolved over time. I mean, for me, uh, back, I would say 2008, 2009. I had, you know, I was I was well into this lifestyle, and I was starting to explore what my capabilities physically through these ultra endurance races that I was doing. And I was blogging about it at the time on a blog that no one was reading, but kind of sharing my insights and my thoughts and and how this lifestyle had really revolutionized, uh, you know, everything about how I was living. Uh, and the, the, like I said, like no one was reading this blog, but there was one person who actually did read it, which was Sanjay Gupta at CNN. And he took an interest in my story, ended up coming to my house and, and, and doing a CNN piece on, on what had occurred in my life. And, and when that aired, I suddenly was shellacked with like thousands of emails over the, por the course of like 72 hours of people from all over the world who had seen the piece and had connected with it in a certain way and were sharing very intimate details about their own personal struggles and their own personal lives. And for me, that was a kind of a lightning bolt moment of, of realizing and understanding that what I was doing perhaps could be of service to other people in a meaningful way. Uh, and, and I really took that to heart. And that's what led to me ultimately writing the book that I wrote, Finding Ultra, which connected with a lot of people. And then starting the podcast in 2012 was just my way of trying to uh, continue a conversation that the book had started and make it not about me, but about all these amazing people that I've been blessed to be able to connect with, like Leilani, who's been on the show, and some of the other people here, uh, and share their story so that I could continue my advocacy beyond just my personal self into you know, all these other people that are, that are turning what used to be kind of a fringe thing into what is now very much a mainstream movement. So, okay, Luke, let's hear your story and then how it formed your voice. For sure, uh, and my story started probably about 2010. I was a bodybuilder traditionally, uh, high protein, low carb, easily a kilo of meat or 2.2 pounds of meat per day. So I had my typical bodybuilder's diet, like chicken day, fish day, and I was on a whole host of supplements. So I competed in 2010, particularly to overcome a very negative point of, uh, in my life. 
And 2010, I placed in that competition, but I think it really started when my wife made this switch to pl plant-based diet because she had digestive issues. And I saw that change that happened to her in just a few days, really. So I was in really, really interested. And, I got, and she shared with me this book by food, uh, The Food Revolution by John Robbins. And I, sh I read the book on, okay, well, plant-based diet is not only more ethical, healthy, but also better for the environment. So it really sparked an interest. But the penny really dropped for me was when I watched the documentary Earthlings, and all of a sudden, I was absolutely disgusted at how animals were treated. And I was under this lie, like taking the red pill in the matrix in that sense. I felt lied to. So I remember turning up. On, on, I was a personal trainer back then, and the next day I just walked up with a kilo of tofu in my, in my, in my, and I did not know what I was doing. So fast forward to that, I, I, trust me, a kilo of tofu doesn't sit very well in your stomach. <laughs> and yeah, I just snorted there, that's funny. <laughs> But anyway, um, 2013, I decided to stand on stage again as a vegan, and I placed to that competition. And 2015, I connected with Team Plant, Bill Giacomo, who might come later with Robert Cheek and all of them. I competed, and I won that competition. And 2017, I decided I wanted to hang up my pink posing trunks. I was like, I'm done with bodybuilding. I went into CrossFit. So throughout my whole experience, I've met so many incredibly uh, inspiring athletes, and I was in interviewed for the Plant Peel Summit in 2015. And I was like, how could I make this information available, bring the health and the fitness and inspiration all at one place? And I think when you share your vision with everyone, the, the right people come into your life, right opportunities. And I met my good friend, Toby, who's my co-host. And fast forward, I've interviewed over 80 of the top experts around the world. Some of them I've actually see, I see in the stage in the flesh for the very first time in which has been uh, a very, very big inspiration of mine and to share the stage here with you as well, Lilani. Uh, it's just incredible. So, so I think for me, you know, everybody shares, oh look, you're from Singapore, crazy rich Asian, have you watched that? <laughs> so, no, I haven't and I will. So I'm not the crazy rich Asian, I'm just a crazy Asian that believed that I could change the way the fitness industry looks at food because I think the fitness industry perpetuates this ridiculous mindset because we all know fruits and vegetables eating a whole diet is good for us but the fitness industry perpetuates this high protein mentality and i hope that through my work i can change that from the inside out your path if you will was very clear for you of how you were going to use your voice for activism but for all of us who are going to go forth you know, we can't be Ritual or Leilani, and maybe we don't have a million followers. So I'm wondering if you can help people if they're stuck saying like, well, what, what can I do if I'm not, you know, Ritual, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, as I mentioned, I began talking about this in 2008, actually 2007, earlier than that. So this is, you know, I'm sitting up here 11 years later, and you say, well, not everyone can be rich role, but like, it's been 11 years of consistently advocating, showing up, putting in the work uh, for no other reason than for the joy of it, you know, not looking to like build a huge following, but just following my internal voice and my instinct about what was right for me. And very often, I didn't, I didn't know what I, I, most of the time, I don't know what I'm doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. I've learned to trust my instincts on that and trust that the, the next move will be shown to me. Um, but I think for anybody out there who's, who's trying to find that within themselves, find out what's unique about you. Don't try to emulate somebody else. Like, what is it? We all have a voice, and we need everybody's most authentic, unique perspective on this movement. What is it? about you that makes you different and unique and how can you speak to that rather than trying to model yourself after somebody else. And the great thing is that we now all have these modes of distribution for free that are in our pockets. So whether you're talented at the written word or making videos or pithy tweets or showing up at rallies, there's a million different ways to slice this loaf of bread. And I think it comes down to really connecting with yourself and what you're passionate about. And I think the more you trust that in yourself, rely on that, cultivate that, um, that will set you on the best trajectory for you. And I think secondarily to that, it's important to not be results-minded. Like, oh, well, I haven't built this huge following in, in the last three days. Well, it's not about that, right? This is the journey of life. So the more that you're doing it for the joy and the passion, 
and, and the integrity of it, I think you'll find within that a sustainable fuel that will power you through the difficult times and the obstacles uh, that you will inevitably face as you kind of go forward. So it's not about comparing yourself to what somebody else is doing, it's about finding what really moves you. And if you can find that, then you won't care about what anyone else is doing and the path will get laid out in front of you. Yeah, I agree with everything that Rich said. Um, one of the things that I had to learn, because I'm, I'm vegan for the animals and for the planet, and that's what I've always talked about, and whenever I'm trying to convince a friend or talk to people on social media, I was always posting things about what was most important to me, which was the planet and the animals. Um, but then when we started doing this race program where I was actively feeding all of these NASCAR fans, which are mostly meat eaters, um, vegan food, they did some research to find out effect partners, to find out what is it that actually converts the public to people that are meat eaters or vegetarians to a vegan lifestyle. And they actually found that, that health was the number one reason why people make that initial change. And then after they've made the initial change for health, then they become open to the things that I cared about, which was the animals and the planet. Um, so I had to kind of learn to change the dialogue that I was having depending on who I was talking to. Um, so at the racetrack, we really changed the program from last year to this year, where we focused really completely on health. So my race car last year was the vegan powered car, and we talked about all the reasons to be vegan, which, you know, animals, planet, your health, world hunger, there's so many reasons. And so the car was sort of all encompassing. We were talking about every reason to be vegan. Well, after I saw the data and what the science showed, I realized, okay, this is one of the reasons a lot of my friends hadn't switched because I was telling them to watch Earthlings or Cowspiracy or Racing Extinction, but really I should have been telling them to watch Forks Over Knives and What the Health, but I didn't know that. And um, so it's, it's helped me to sort of learn, okay, if I really care about the animals and the planet, then I need to learn how to talk to people in a way that's going to sort of move them in my direction, but maybe in a way that I'm more likely to win them over. So that's been a real learning experience for me in the last year or so. So I would just stay, as an activist, say, stay open and, and try and look at how you're gonna be most effective. Um, yeah, I d definitely agree with both of you, and it's about owning your story and knowing where you stand as well. But I think it, from, from my point of view, is facing your fears, because a lot of, your fe a lot of time your fears are a signal to what you need to improve on. Like for me, it was public speaking. I mean, back in the day, I would not imagine standing in front here with so many cameras in front of me and, and sharing my, my story, but here I am, and, and this has been an incredible journey. Um, but, but yeah, I remember walking up into, and also self-education, I remember walking into a room full of entrepreneurs and business owners, and here I was, this vegan bodybuilder, Chinese very vegan bodybuilder, I wasn't sure what I was doing, but my goal was to maximize my impact in whatever way possible through my advocacy. Um, so I took up a course in entrepreneurship, and because I, I figured that I, could, I, I, re, you know, I was preparing fitness models for competition, but I realized I was just helping one person at a time, so I was just thinking, how can I maximize my impact? So through my journey through entrepreneurship and, and, and now the Plant Fit Summit, um, I found that that's really just finding what your niche is. And I think social media is a quite, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes we're just really attracted by the likes and follows, and we forget to be who we are. I think social media is one aspect, but it's finding out where your true strengths are. And I did a, a, a test, and, and I shared this with .c a while back. So I think a lot of times our instinct is there, and, and just like, you know, how we actually digest and assimilate food or just like, a, I think our instinct is inbuilt, but we need to just kind of release what's bad in our life and our true wisdom and our true instinct actually comes to make us and create opportunities for us to actually thrive and, and really help and support a greater cause. I think for me, um, really, I started off being attracted to this whole social media thing and wanting to start a YouTube channel, looking at YouTubers with million subscribers and with a thousand views, and it's like, oh, wow, maybe I want to be a YouTuber to maximize my goal and my impact, my, my advocacy. But I realized in the whole journey itself, it was the process of learning how to film, learning to be comfortable in the camera, learning what, the YouTube, what YouTube was, and really being comfortable in my own skin, focusing on the pro process, not the outcome.
there's so much bad news in the world and it can, um, it can get you down. I, I know a lot of activists that struggle with being depressed about this stuff because you feel like the whole weight of the world is on your shoulders because you're trying to change things. And um, the one thing that I always remember when I feel down is there was a study done in 2011 by some scientists that wanted to figure out if there's a tipping point for ideas. And they actually found that if just 10% of the population has an unwavering belief in an idea, that it's actually inevitable that the majority of society will adopt that idea. And the, one of the scientists that worked on the study said that he watched the idea struggle, but as soon as it hit 10%, it spread like a flame. And so that gives me hope, because I feel like 10%, you know, even with veganism, we're getting pretty close there. The, the last numbers I saw was 6% of the US population, which is an increase of 600% in the last three years. Um, so all of us here are part of that tipping point. And just to keep in mind, you know, when you feel down, that we are making a difference, and we're, we're getting close to the tipping point, I think. That's great. Thank you. Um, I, hate the, I hate that word failure, you know, it, it, I, I feel like we need a new or different word. Um, I've certainly failed a lot. I've failed way more than I've succeeded, and I think failure is part and parcel of success. There is no success story without a tremendous amount of failure. And to fail is also to say that you were willing to take a risk. So when you experienced what you did with YouTube, you had the courage to try something and then go, all right, well, this is not for me and, and, and readjust. So to cons I don't consider that a failure. I consider that a courageous act, right? So I think that, uh, I think that, that, uh, that it's about the courage of putting yourself out there and allowing yourself to be vulnerable, especially with this movement, because you know once you step out there, you're exposing yourself to some form of ridicule or dissonance or um, disagreement with the public. And so I applaud anybody who has the spine and the wherewithal and the courage to take that, to take that step because they feel that that is what is right. And just kind of um, echo the previous sentiment that I made, you know, in this, in this uh, social media culture that we're in, everybody's like, how many followers you have? And, and you feel like if you don't have hundred, hundreds of thousands of followers that you're some kind of failure. Well, there's a lot of people out there with a lot of followers who aren't really impacting people's lives in a material or positive way. But if you can just make not just a positive impact, but a transformative impact, a sustainably transformative positive impact, on one person, that is massive. I want to thank everybody, Rich Roll, Leilani Munter, Luke Tan, awesome vegans, all of them.